Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is yet another crazy case that involves a jealous ex who feels that the only way they're going to get their ex back is to take out the competition. It literally never makes any sense. It seems to be like a bit of a theme going on right now with people trying to hire hitmen to take out other people. It's a very scary thing, but this case in particular is definitely an interesting one. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to GlassesUSA.com for partnering with me on today's video. If you're anything like me and you are blind like I am, then you know how expensive glasses can be and how much of a hassle it can be to get them directly from your eye doctor. However, GlassesUSA.com makes that process so much easier and so much more affordable. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online without ever leaving your home, all at affordable prices. GlassesUSA.com offers almost 10,000 styles of glasses and sunglasses, including in-home brands like Audido, which is what I'm wearing right now. These eyeglasses are also from Audido. I also have my pair of Amelia E sunglasses, which is what these ones are, and then I have my pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses, which are another of my go-to sunglasses. I like to have multiples of glasses and sunglasses. I like having extra glasses already packed into my travel bags and my overnight bags in case I forget to pack them, which has happened when I travel. I've been traveling a lot recently, and that seems to always slip my mind, which is crazy because I literally need glasses glasses to see, but I never end up leaving without them because I already have a pair packed in my travel bags. I also like having multiple pairs for when I do wear eyeglasses during the day. I always have a pair that will match with whatever outfit I'm wearing at that time. I also keep a pair of sunglasses in my car and in my purse as well as extras at home, so I'm always prepared no matter where I am. I have very sensitive eyes and I live in the most sunny of states in Arizona and I'm very forgetful, so it's nice to know that I always have a pair of sunglasses ready for when I might need them. GlassesUSA.com also carries designer brands, like I said, like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Gucci, and so many more. You can find any style and color that you can imagine, as well as specialty glasses like kids' glasses, sports glasses, safety glasses, and more. Also with GlassesUSA.com, you can add any prescription to almost any pair of frames, including sunglasses and blue light blocking glasses, which is great if you're looking at screens all day like so many of us do. The glasses I'm wearing right now are blue light blocking glasses as well. GlassesUSA.com is also the perfect place to stock up and save on your contact lenses. You can get 25% off of all contact lens brands, including Vista, AccuView Dailies, BioInfinity, which is what I wear, and so many more. They're available with any prescription for all uses. I personally wear contacts for most of my day, especially when I'm working out and when I'm at work, running around with kids all day. But the best part of GlassesUSA.com is the price point. A complete pair of glasses starts at only $39 and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. It's so easy. All you do is enter your prescription, place your order, and that's it. You're done. Standard shipping is free on all orders, no matter how much you spend. And if for some reason you aren't happy with your order, you have 14 days to return it for a refund, exchange, or 100% store credit, no questions asked. Now, GlassesUSA.com is offering an exclusive discount for my viewers on top of the coupon code that they currently have on their website, but it's only available for 24 hours. So make sure you click the link at the top of my description box to get all of the details. Thank you again so much to GlassesUSA.com for partnering with me on today's video. And for the remainder of the video, I am going to be taking off the glasses because I know the glare is bothersome for some people. Okay, now we're ready. With all of that being said, let's get into the details of today's case. Today, we will be discussing the horrific murder of Kendra Hatcher. Kendra Hatcher was born on February 3rd, 1980 in Springfield, Illinois to parents Reagan Hatcher and Bonnie Gibson Jameson Cawley. She also had a stepfather named Bruce and she grew up with three sisters, Jamie, Ashley, and Melissa, and one brother, Neil. Kendra grew up in the small Illinois town of Pleasant Plains and she attended Pleasant Plains High School. 
She was the captain of her cheerleading team and she played volleyball before graduating high school in 1998. During that time, she would also go on missions trips to help build churches and lead Bible studies for children growing up in poverty. Then she went on to DePaul University in Indiana, graduating with her bachelor's degree. Then she went on to study at the University of Kentucky College of Dentistry. From there, she worked as a pediatric dentist. While attending school, Kendra spent her spring breaks volunteering for Habitat for Humanity. Family and friends said that Kendra absolutely loved working with children. She loved spending time with her nieces and nephews especially. She was someone who loved to give back, going to Spain and Ecuador to provide dental work for children who needed it. She also lived a very active lifestyle, which included yoga and running. She was known to be compassionate and full of love for others. She was resilient, strong, and determined to achieve any goals that she set her mind to. But outside of her tough exterior, on the inside, she was soft and delicate with a tender heart. That is what drew people to her. While attending DePaul University, she met a man named Scott. Scott worked as an anesthesiologist, and him and Kendra went on to get married. Scott would go on to say that him and Kendra spent many of their formative years together, being that they met in college, they got married, and started their lives and their careers together. The two spent their time hiking mountains, going river rafting, traveling internationally, and they went on tons of adventures together. However, the two ended up getting a divorce and going their separate ways. It seemed like a pretty amicable split, with the two deciding that they just wanted different things out of life. So, they took space away from one another and started their new chapters in their lives. By 2010, hoping for a fresh start, Kendra ended up moving to Dallas, Texas, where she continued her work as a dentist. While there, she moved to the high-rise apartment complex called Gables Park 17 in Dallas's Uptown. This was a very luxurious apartment featuring an infinity pool, a fitness studio, a coffee bar, and a cyber lounge. By June of 2015, 35-year-old Kendra met a 38-year-old man named Ricardo Penigua, who went by Ricky. The two met on Tinder. Ricky was a graduate of Stanford Medical School, coming to Dallas in 2011 to do his residency in dermatology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He was known to be an amazing doctor who was polite and was said to have had the best bedside manner. He too had been divorced before moving to Texas, and him and Kendra seemed to get along very well. They were both doctors, both dedicated to their careers, both very intelligent, and both very attractive people. When Kendra first met Ricky, she was immediately intrigued with him. The two went on their first date, and from there, their relationship blossomed quickly from there. They got along very well. They had the same values, and many of their interests aligned. They spent that summer dining at high-scale, fashionable uptown restaurants, they took nice trips together, and by all accounts, the two fell in love very quickly. Just a few months later, by that September, they had even started talking about marriage, and Kendra had even flown all the way out to San Francisco to meet Ricky's parents for a long weekend. Things seemed to be going amazingly for the couple. The weekend of Labor Day in 2015, the couple were set out to fly for another long weekend vacation to Cancun, Mexico. However, on that day, September 2nd, everything changed. Kendra had been in her parking garage at her apartment complex, Gables Park 17, when a man just all of a sudden walked up to her and shot her in the back of her head completely without reason, without warning, and completely out of the blue, Kendra was dead. When police arrived to the scene, they found that Kendra's purse had been taken, so initially they thought that maybe she was killed as a part of a robbery gone wrong. That is where the initial investigation took them, because otherwise, those around Kendra knew her as a sweet, gentle, compassionate woman who worked with kids every day. No one knew anyone who would want to hurt her. She didn't have enemies. In fact, everyone who knew her loved her. Of course, one of the first people that investigators had to look into was the man she was dating, Ricky. Police took him in and questioned him, and he basically said what everybody else said 
that he had no reason to want to hurt her, and he certainly didn't know anybody else who would want to hurt her. But police didn't look into Ricky for too long because he was at work when this happened, so there was no way that he could have been responsible. So once again, police were at square one. However, only about a week into the investigation, police were taken in a completely different direction than anything they could have imagined. So when police first started their investigation, they looked at the surveillance video from the apartment complex, and they found that the shooter was most likely driving a black Jeep Cherokee. Police didn't really have much more to go off of, so they released the images of the black Jeep to the media in hopes that somebody would recognize the car. That is when a man named Jose Ortiz reached out to the police saying that this was actually his car. He said that on the morning of September 2nd, he loaned his car to a couple of friends, a 31-year-old woman named Brenda Delgado and another 24-year-old woman named Crystal Cortez. He told the police that initially, after seeing the Jeep on the news, he met up with Brenda and asked her about it. And initially, Brenda told Jose that it wasn't his Jeep on the news. But eventually, after a little bit of pushing, Brenda apparently told Jose that her friend Crystal had been driving the Jeep at the time, and she told him that Crystal had a drug problem. She said that maybe Crystal was meeting up with someone for drugs and that something went wrong. She told Jose not to answer the phone if Crystal called him because she didn't know what Crystal could have been involved with. Brenda recommended that Jose hide his car and paint it a different color, offering to pay for the paint job because Jose said that he didn't want to be driving around the car that was on the news. She also advised him not to tell anybody about this because if he did, he could get in trouble and lose his citizenship. But Jose talked to his family about this and they all thought that it was very strange and very telling that Brenda would try to bring up his citizenship as a way to manipulate him. So he did the opposite of what she asked of him and he contacted the police. He continued to say that Brenda and Crystal had been driving this silver BMW that was having mechanical issues, so she took it to his shop to get fixed, and then he lent them his Jeep to use in the meantime. Jose was a friend of Brenda's, but he was also a car repairman, so he was always her go-to for whenever she was having car troubles. By 9 or 10 p.m. that same day, they met back up and returned his Jeep, and Jose gave them their BMW back. So, police went ahead and contacted Crystal Cortez and Brenda Delgado. At first, they couldn't get a hold of Brenda, so they only spoke with Crystal. At first, Crystal said that she did borrow that Jeep and that she did go to the Gables Park 17 apartment complex, but she said that it was because she was looking for a parking spot because she wanted to eat dinner at a Mexican restaurant that was located a few blocks away and there wasn't anything closer. When she was asked about the shooting that took place, she said that she was actually with her son on the day of the shooting and that she was only parking at that parking garage so she could take her son to play at the Clyde Warren Park located nearby. So now she already had two different stories and obviously police were not buying it. So she changed her story again. She was now saying that there was a man named Lamar who she didn't know personally, but he had put her at gunpoint and forced her to drive into the parking garage to commit a robbery. But again, this just didn't seem right either and police weren't buying it. So again, another story. She then admitted that her friend Brenda paid her and Lamar to rob Kendra but she said that she had no idea that Lamar was going to shoot her. But she did say that once she heard that he did shoot her, she tried driving away, but he was quick. He hopped back into the car and told her to drive away, and she did so because he had a gun and she was afraid that he was going to shoot her. But then after continuing to call her out on her lies, police continued questioning her, and she ultimately worked with prosecutors on this case to make a deal. From there, Crystal spilled all of the tea. Now, Crystal making that deal with the prosecutors and telling them everything, that did happen later, but I want to tell you all now to sort of just make the timeline easier to understand, and then we will get back to the questioning of Crystal and Brenda later in the video. But either way, it turns out Brenda and Ricky had been in a long-term relationship before Ricky got together with Kendra. 
Brenda and Ricky had met back in August of 2012 via a dating app, and their relationship progressed just as quickly as what I described with Kendra and Ricky. Brenda herself had always dreamed of going to medical school, but she came from very humble beginnings in a working-class immigrant family, so she wasn't going to be able to afford the tuition. So for the time being, she worked as a dental assistant. When she met Ricky, she was immediately intrigued by him. He was quite the catch. He was handsome, and Brenda was very appreciative of how studious and smart Ricky was. He loved research and was involved in a few published studies, and he took his career very seriously. Ricky and Brenda quickly fell for each other, and after only three months of dating, Brenda moved in with Ricky into his luxury apartment. During their relationship, they were described as inseparable. Ricky gave Brenda a promise ring, and by all accounts, Ricky treated Brenda very well. He met Brenda's parents and tried his best to learn Spanish so that he could speak with them. She was in love with Ricky, and she was so excited for what the future held for them. She wanted to get married, and she wanted to have children with Ricky one day. However, by June of 2014, Ricky told Brenda that he wanted to move on. He no longer wanted to be in a relationship with her, and he asked her to move out. He didn't really give a good reason for the breakup, and it seemed that Brenda did not take the breakup well at all. She had been in dental hygienist school at that time, but after the breakup, her grades suffered. She even had to withdraw from the program for a few weeks just because she couldn't concentrate on her studies from how devastated she was. So, the two had been broken up for a couple of months until one night, Brenda and Ricky had signed up for the same salsa dancing class. Now, with this class, the way it worked is that you would dance with one partner for a few minutes and then you would switch and move on to the next partner. Of course, eventually, Ricky and Brenda started their dancing together and they reconnected after that. It seemed that the dancing sort of reignited their spark. After that dance class, Ricky let Brenda back into his life and he was open to giving that relationship another try. But this time, they didn't move in together. Brenda got her own apartment about a mile away from Ricky's. He did also help her pay for some of her expenses, like with rent and utilities and things like that, since she was still in school. She was on his cell phone plan, and while there, things were going great in their relationship. She started to think about marriage as an option for them once again. But as time progressed, Ricky started to have doubts again. And by February of 2015, Ricky broke up with Brenda once again, and this time it was for good. Then, like I said, by June of that year, Ricky met Kendra and he let Brenda know about her. He told Brenda that he was very happy in his new relationship and that things were going really great between them. He told Brenda that he wanted to stay platonic friends, and they did. They still checked in with one another, they still texted once in a while, and they did stay in contact. She would even offer to help him if he had problems, like car problems, doing things like driving him to and from work while his car was being repaired. She hooked him up with Jose, and he was the one that fixed his car and gave him probably a better rate. Brenda was always very pleasant for Ricky to be around, never bringing up the relationship or the breakup or even his new girlfriend. By August 31st of that year, Brenda had graduated from her dental hygienist program, and right before that, Ricky had texted Brenda to wish her luck on her final exams. But at the same time, he did also let her know that he was going to be taking her off of his cell phone plan, he also mentioned that he would be moving to Sacramento that October because he had been offered a position at a medical practice there. He asked Brenda if she knew anybody that would be willing to buy some furniture from his apartment, and things seemed to go great with that conversation as well. She didn't seem bothered, she congratulated him on his new job, and things were very cordial. However, even with her being cordial this entire time, even with him telling her about the move, Brenda was very upset. She realized at this point that things between him and Kendra were getting more serious. She probably thought at the beginning of the relationship that the fling between him and Kendra was just a rebound type of thing and that he would come back to her eventually, but she started to realize that that seemed to just be a dream. 
She realized at that point that her and Ricky weren't going to be getting back together, especially if Kendra was still in his life. And she felt that the only way that she would even have a chance at getting back together with Ricky is if she took Kendra out of the picture. It turned out that ever since her and Ricky's breakups, she was able to track him. My thought is that she probably knew about that salsa class that he signed up for that evening way back when, and she probably went to that same one on purpose, but that's just what I think. She had his iCloud account loaded into another iPhone that was in her possession, so she was able to read his messages, track his movements, and basically keep tabs on everything that he was doing with Kendra. She also still had a set of keys to his apartment, so she kept tabs on him and what he was doing. She had screenshots of the airfare reservations that the pair had to visit Denver for Ricky's birthday. She read the text messages that the two had shared. Then she found out that him and Kendra went to San Francisco so that she could meet his parents. She found out that the two were planning this trip to Cancun together. She found out that Ricky was even planning on visiting Pleasant Plains to meet Kendra's parents and attend the town's fall festival. She realized that the pair was getting serious. Not only that, but she was jealous. She was pissed that him and Kendra were going on all of these nice vacations together, but Ricky never took her anywhere except to meet his parents. She saw pictures on Kendra's Facebook page of all of the things that they did as a pair, and Brenda was not happy to see those things. To me, again, I think the fact that they went on these vacations together is probably because Kendra could pay her way, Ricky probably was not paying for Kendra to go on all of these vacations, and he probably didn't want to pay for Brenda's part in the vacation. She probably didn't have the money to be going, so that's probably why they went on more vacations. I don't think it's like Ricky all of a sudden was just treating this other woman so much better. I think it was a situation of money at that point, but I digress. That doesn't really matter, but I do just want to say that because... Some people might find that a little bit salty. But either way, rather than trying to leave Kendra threatening voicemails or like physically stalking her and leaving her threats and mailing her things or reaching out to Ricky to tell him off or beg for him to come back or cry or whatever, she stayed quiet. She stalked in silence. But then she realized that she needed to take action. She needed to get Kendra out of the picture if there was ever a chance that Ricky would get back together with her. Brenda started by asking other friends about getting revenge. There was one friend named Jennifer who she had been living with for a few weeks. Jennifer would later say that Brenda suggested to her that if she hurt Kendra or Ricky, that Brenda would buy her drugs or even pay for her car. She asked that Jennifer beat Ricky into a coma with a bat. She asked that maybe her friend attack Kendra by grabbing her from behind and sticking her with a needle filled with drugs or maybe stabbing her in the chest. Jennifer wasn't the only one that Brenda was expressing these obsessive thoughts to. She would tell anybody who would listen about what she wanted to do to Kendra or Ricky. And anybody who heard about this would tell Brenda to chill, that she doesn't need to do anything crazy they said that whatever it is you're trying to do, do not do it. It is not worth it. Eventually, Jennifer became so freaked out that she moved out of the apartment that she shared with Brenda, but Brenda had met another woman through Jennifer, a 23-year-old single mother named Crystal Cortez. Crystal had come by the apartment a few times to let her six-year-old son swim in their pool. Crystal was down on her luck at the time. She was broke. She was living in a rundown neighborhood with her mother. She made $11 an hour and she was barely making ends meet. Crystal thought that Brenda was just the coolest girl. Brenda was helping out her friend Jennifer who was in the middle of a breakup when she moved into Brenda's apartment. Brenda had nice clothes, nice makeup, a nice TV, and she drove a Lexus. So Crystal was really excited when Brenda befriended her. She started taking her to dinners, and when Brenda started complaining to her about Ricky and Kendra, Crystal offered a listening ear. Then Brenda expressed to Crystal that she was absolutely fed up with Kendra and the relationship she had with her ex. She wanted her gone. So Brenda offered Crystal $500 to help out with taking Kendra out, and Crystal said that she agreed because she was dead broke. 
It was also stated that Brenda was sort of flaunting her money in the days before they agreed to do this, even more so than she did before. Obviously, this was to show Crystal that she was good for the money that she promised and to show that like, hey, I live this luxurious lifestyle, you can too. You just gotta help me out with a little something. From there, Crystal and Brenda had several discussions and meetings to plan out how they would kill Kendra. They thought about injecting her with heroin or some sort of sedative. They discussed shooting her with a gun. They went through all of these different ideas and decided that the best idea was to shoot her. Her and Brenda went to Academy Sports and Outdoors to purchase a gun, but they ended up deciding not to purchase it because they figured it would be too easy to track that purchase back to them. Then they decided that they wouldn't be able to get it done with just the two of them. So Brenda asked Crystal if she knew anybody that would help. From there, they started driving around Crystal's rundown neighborhood and started asking some neighbors for help. They sort of asked questions to see if they were credible and if this person would actually be able to help and if they determined that somebody didn't seem right for the job, they would just leave. But then Crystal stopped at her mother's house and at the mother's house, there happened to be two men over. One was a neighbor and the other was a friend of the neighbor named Christopher Love who had brought his children to the home so that they could jump on the trampoline. 31-year-old Christopher Love was known around the area for selling weed. He also had numerous tattoos and a bit of a record. Starting in his teen years, he had been convicted of all sorts of things from aggravated assault, aggravated robbery, and burglary of a residence. So Brenda and Crystal asked Christopher to chat and he met back up with them at his apartment. When talking to Christopher, Brenda told him that she had connections to a drug cartel, which obviously wasn't true, but he didn't know that. But she promised Christopher that if he helped her take out Kendra, that she would be able to pay him the equivalent of $3,000 in drugs and cash. Brenda asked Christopher if he had a gun, to which he said yes, and he showed her his 40 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol. Then Brenda contacted a firearms dealer and asked them if they had a silencer for a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson. Based on the court documents, I'm not sure if she did get that silencer, but I think they included it to say that like she was contacting people, she was trying to get accessories for a gun, so it showed that she was involved in this entire thing. She also purchased a pair of gloves for the shooter to wear so that their prints wouldn't be left behind. Initially, the plan was actually for Crystal to shoot Kendra with Christopher's gun, and he agreed to be the getaway driver. But they actually ended up swapping roles because Crystal said that she knew the Dallas area better, so she would have been able to drive them around and get them out of there quicker. Then Brenda decided that the killing needed to take place on September 2nd, the day before Kendra and Ricky were planning to leave for Cancun. They planned to make it appear like a robbery gone wrong. And the days before, Crystal and Brenda had followed Kendra around to get an idea of her daily routine, where she would be at certain times, where she parked her car, and things like that. On September 1st, they all did a dry run where Brenda, Crystal, and Christopher drove from his apartment to Kendra's work and then to her apartment to figure out exactly how the timing should work with everything. The same day, they stole a temporary license plate off of a blue Durango at a random apartment complex in North Dallas to put on the car on the morning of the murder. Now, originally, Brenda had actually borrowed a friend's silver BMW that Crystal was going to drive because again, Brenda owned a Lexus. So it seemed that she parked the Lexus elsewhere and then borrowed a friend's BMW to drive on the day of the murder. However, that morning, the car was having engine problems, so it wasn't drivable. Crystal and Brenda then took the car to their friend Jose Ortiz's auto repair shop to get it fixed. While getting it fixed, that is when Jose let Crystal borrow his black Jeep Cherokee. So like I said earlier, she made it seem like the BMW was her car, but it wasn't. That was also a borrowed car. Then after getting the black Jeep Cherokee, Crystal dropped Brenda off at the public library so that she could meet up with a classmate for their upcoming dental hygiene certification. It seems that after graduating from school, there's a separate test to actually get certified. That is how my license works. I went to school to get my doctorate and then I got my license by passing the boards from each state. Each state has their own boards. But either way, that seems to be the absolute perfect alibi for Brenda since she would be there with another person who could say that she was there 
Even better if the library had some surveillance cameras. She was there during the time that Kendra was being murdered, so there was no way that she could be involved. After dropping Brenda off, Crystal then went ahead and picked up Christopher. They then parked across the street from the dental office where Kendra worked. They sat there for a while, just watching Kendra's white Toyota Camry that was parked in the street. Then by 2.30, Crystal actually had to pick up her son from school. So she dropped Christopher back off, picked her son up, stopped at Sonic to get him lunch, and then dropped him off at his grandmother's house. Then she returned back to Christopher's apartment to pick him up, and then the two headed back to the dental office. And lucky for them, Kendra's car was still parked there. They continued watching her car with binoculars until she finally walked out of the office and into her car. Early that evening, Kendra left work and drove away with Crystal and Christopher following behind. But at one point, they lost Kendra because Kendra actually stopped at a friend's house to grab some stuff to bring with her on her vacation to Cancun. So after losing her in traffic, instead of trying to find her and follow her again, they just went straight to the Gables Park 17 apartments to wait for her there. They entered the parking garage, first parking in a visitor spot, and then as another car who lived in the apartment complex pulled in, they drove up behind that car to get into the garage. Now, with any gated apartment complexes that I've lived in, there is just a security code that you need to type in to get the gate open. And if you're right behind someone who opens the gate, then you can just drive right in. There's no one actually manning the station or anyone there to check who is entering and leaving. It's literally the most pointless thing to have a gated community if you can just wait for another car who has the code to just come in right behind them. That's a whole nother issue on its own. I think the whole gated community thing at apartment complexes is literally just to show, like make it look safe when really anybody can come in and go out. But again, not the point. Either way, because they had watched her before this day, they knew what car she drove. And again, they knew that it was a white Toyota Camry. They also knew where she typically parked, so they chose a spot that was close enough to where she normally went so that they could catch her before she went inside. As they waited, Christopher stayed huddled up in the back seat, cleaning up the bullets and the gun magazine with the wipe to avoid leaving fingerprints on anything. They waited for a half hour to an hour before Kendra arrived back to the apartment complex parking garage and parked near them. As she was parking, Christopher got out of the car and walked towards where she was. Just as Kendra got out of her car and was turning around to get her stuff before heading in, Christopher shot her in the back of her head. Crystal would later say that she didn't physically see Christopher shoot Kendra, but she had heard the shots fired. After shooting Kendra, Christopher ran up to her to grab her purse and the camera that she had just borrowed from that friend. Like I said, she stopped at that friend's house. She was actually borrowing a camera to use on her vacation, but Christopher took that. Again, they wanted to make it look like a robbery gone wrong. As he was doing that, Crystal started backing out of the parking spot and Christopher quickly ran back to the car and hopped into the rear passenger side of the car to avoid being seen. At first, Crystal actually drove the wrong way because she thought there was another exit, so she had to turn around and go back the way that she came in to exit the same way that she entered. Then, Crystal drove the pair to an abandoned house in Pleasant Grove to clean out the Jeep of fingerprints and then put the real license plate back on. Then, Christopher went through Kendra's things and he did end up taking the cash out of her wallet. Then, Crystal dropped Christopher back off before heading back to pick up her son and take him home. That evening, Brenda met back up with Crystal to give her the BMW that she had just picked up from Jose's repair shop and trade that for the Jeep that he let her borrow. Now, I guess before borrowing the BMW from a friend, Brenda had left her Lexus at a local Mexican restaurant to leave it there while they murdered Kendra. So after getting the BMW back to Crystal, they must have dropped it off and then drove the Jeep to get the Lexus, and then the two of them tried to find a secluded area to get rid of the things that they took from Kendra, but there wasn't anywhere good to do that. So, they ended up going back to Crystal's mother's house to burn the items there. They ended up burning Kendra's wallet and the contents inside, the hoodie that Crystal was wearing at the time of the shooting, 
as well as Christopher's t-shirt that he was wearing when he shot Kendra. Then they dropped the Jeep back off to Jose to return it back to him. And at some point during all of that, Brenda and Jose had stopped to get dinner together. So again, just trying to create this elaborate alibi. After that, Brenda ended up buying $600 worth of marijuana and $300 worth of cocaine and gave that as well as some cash to Christopher. Then Brenda did give Crystal that $500, so at least she kept true to her word, although I'm sure Crystal and Christopher would have turned on Brenda pretty quickly if she hadn't. Now, once again, after the murder was committed, police didn't know where to look first. Like I said, they did question Ricky, but he didn't know anybody who could have wanted to hurt Kendra. He had no idea that Brenda, his most recent ex, would be capable of something so horrific. In fact, he texted Brenda after Kendra was shot to let her know the news that he lost his girlfriend so tragically. And Brenda acted very concerned. She was willing to do almost anything to help Ricky with whatever he needed. She was a shoulder to cry on. But after learning about this new surveillance video that had been released to the public, which showed the Jeep and a woman driving it, Ricky went back to the police. He told them that it almost looked like Brenda was the one who was driving the Jeep. And again, we know that it wasn't her, but clearly something in the back of his head was telling him that Brenda was not so innocent in all of this. He told police that he was starting to get scared because Brenda was going to be coming over later that day to buy him groceries. So, of course, after seeing that video and learning this whole crazy story from Crystal and Jose, police found Brenda and went to pick her up to have a chat. When they brought her in, police told her right away that they were investigating the murder of Kendra and she seemed confused. Her body language seemed inviting at first, leaning in and looking curiously at investigators. She asked them how her name came up. As the interview went on, they asked her about her whereabouts that day. She confidently told them just what we learned, that she was at the library with a friend, and then Crystal came to pick her up and took her to the shop to exchange cars. She said that she stopped at Chili's for dinner that night with Jose after the car exchange, and she was very forthcoming with offering up the receipts and the names of everybody who could confirm her story and confirm her alibi but she was having a hard time remembering where or when she got from place to place. She also mentioned that her phone had died while she was at Chili's. She also told investigators that she didn't even know Kendra. She said that the relationship between her and Ricky hadn't been all that serious and that she wasn't upset that they had broken up. She wasn't concerned with who Ricky was dating and she had no idea what the girl even looked like. She said that she didn't know anything about the black Jeep, saying that Crystal was the one who borrowed it. She said that she did hear about the Jeep being involved with a potential shooting, but she didn't bother to ask Crystal about it. It didn't concern her. So, for the first few hours of the investigation, Brenda didn't budge. She wouldn't admit to any wrongdoing, and she definitely wouldn't admit the true nature of her and Ricky's relationship. Investigators pushed her, using the technique of playing good cop to get on her side, and then making comments about how awful Ricky was to her, saying that Ricky never thought that she was good enough, maybe he wanted someone better looking and more educated like Kendra, someone who came from a nice middle-class family instead of the lower-class poor family like Brenda was from. She wasn't even a doctor. She was just a hygienist, and Ricky, he wanted more than that. They acknowledged that she felt stomped on, degraded, and humiliated, but still, Brenda did not crack. The way that your name came up in the investigation was linked to the vehicle. Okay, the, the, the Jeep, black Jeep. Um, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit specifically about Wednesday, what you were doing Wednesday, and you know, the incident involving the G. Of course. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Wednesday, I was in Carrollton. Okay. And I studied from maybe 12 all the way to like about 6. And then from 6 we went to Fuzzies. We had um, some tacos at Fuzzies in Carrollton. Mm -hmm. And then from Carrollton, we went to the Chili's off the George Bush. Okay. And um, that was my day on Wednesday. Okay. It was my Wednesday. Okay. 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 Okay.
So, police were initially holding her on a traffic ticket violation, but she got that paid off and she was released shortly after. They had nothing to hold her on at this time. Now, like I said earlier, Crystal had come up with a plea agreement with investigators and the prosecution, and that is how we found out about all of this information. But during these initial stages, police were holding Crystal on charges of capital murder while they continued their investigation to pin down what exactly Brenda's involvement was. So, they looked into Crystal's cell phone records, which showed that she was texting this one number in the days leading up to the murder, and of course, that number belonged to Christopher Love. So again, earlier she tried saying that this person's name was Lamar, probably just hiding his true name, but it was Christopher. So, that led them to finding out where he was and where his car was. In the car, they found that Smith & Wesson firearm behind the glove compartment. They brought that gun to the crime lab, and after running tests, they confirmed that this was the handgun that was used to kill Kendra, so he was arrested. As police progressed throughout the investigation, they finally felt like they had enough to connect Brenda to the crime, and after releasing her for the first time, they went back out to arrest her, but this time, she was gone. At the time, police had no idea where she had gone, but she was born in Mexico and she still had family living there. 
So she was technically still a Mexican citizen, even though she was also a legal U.S. citizen. So they indicted her for the murder on October 22nd, 2015, and worked with the FBI to alert Mexican officials in hopes of finding her there. Brenda stayed on the run for six months. It turned out that she had been living with relatives in the town of Torreson, located in north central Mexico. Family said that she acted the way just as she normally did. She didn't seem like anything was wrong. She didn't act off in any way. She was her normal, happy, go lucky self. However, by April 8th, 2016, Brenda was finally arrested by Mexican police. From there, the trials for murder started. Like I said, Crystal ended up taking a plea deal in exchange for her testimony. She was offered a 35-year sentence with the possibility for parole in 15 years. She said that she ultimately agreed to do this because when this all came out, her mother was very disappointed in her, saying that she raised her better than that. She acknowledged that she was foolish at the time, young and simple-minded. She got too caught up in the excitement of all this drama, so she has since learned and she is going to be the one to help put these other people away for their parts in all of this. Christopher's trial for murder started first, taking place in October of 2018. His trial relied heavily on Crystal's testimony, the gun they found, as well as the cell phone evidence that showed their communication in the days leading up to the murder. They argued that he agreed to commit a heinous murder for the benefit of drugs and money. They argued that this wasn't a spur-of-the-moment decision, this wasn't a robbery gone wrong, it was a well-thought-out, meticulously planned-out murder. In the end, the jury was sent off for deliberations, where they spent two hours. After deliberating, the jury found him guilty on capital murder, and they actually sentenced him to death by lethal injection. Uh, Mr. Love, would you stand, please, sir? Having been found guilty by the jury of capital punishment and the jury having answered a unanimous yes to special issue number two and a unanimous no to special, I'm oh, sorry, a unanimous yes to special issue number one and a unanimous no to special issue number two, it is now the duty of the court to assess your punishment, is there any legal reason why punishment should not, not be assessed? No reason at all. All right, there being no legal reason, it's therefore the order of judgment and decree of this court that you be taken by the sheriff of Dallas County and by her safely held for transfer to an authorized receiving agency for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, wherein you shall be confined until the director of that institution receives an order by this court to carry out the sentence of death by lethal injection. Since then, he has requested appeals, but those requests have all been denied. Brenda's trial took place in May of 2019. Once again, prosecutors discussed everything that we have gone over since the murder. They argued that she was heartbroken when Ricky broke up with her. They said that she was obsessed with him after the breakups, that all she wanted was to get back together with him, but when she realized that this wasn't going to happen, she murdered his girlfriend to get her out of the way. But the defense said that Brenda wasn't actually involved in any of this. They came in hot and straight up called Crystal a liar. They said that Crystal is making everything up and that Brenda was not involved. They said that Crystal is motivated by this plea deal to come up with this whole story about what Brenda had done when in reality, she hadn't had any part of this. However, the prosecution brought forward a lot of evidence that contradicted what Brenda and her defense had been saying. She said she didn't know Kendra, but the information on her phone showed otherwise. She had these screenshots of Kendra and Ricky and all of the fun things that they were doing. They had the evidence of her tracking Ricky's movements and following him and Kendra around. She said that she didn't know about the black Jeep, only that Crystal was driving it, but there was surveillance video of Crystal and Brenda both exchanging the BMW for the Jeep. Then there were multiple witnesses who testified about Brenda's obsession with hurting Kendra. As I stated earlier, Brenda had a roommate, Jennifer, who literally moved out because she was so freaked out by what Brenda was saying. There were others who testified that Brenda had become obsessed with the idea of harming Kendra. There was at least four or five different friends or family members who said that every time they were with Brenda, 
she would obsessively talk about Kendra. One friend testified that he asked Brenda why he was so obsessed with Kendra, and apparently this made her so mad that she stopped talking to him for several days. The same friend said that the days before Kendra's murder, she asked him to borrow a gun, but he said no. And again, like I stated earlier, all of these friends kept telling her, whatever it is in your head that you want to do, whatever it is you think you are going to do, chill out, do not do it, it's not that important, this is not worth it. But clearly she did it anyways. Everything that was being argued at trial painted a very clear picture of a woman who was just obsessed with her ex. And there was nothing that she could do to get him back with Kendra still in the picture, so she took the most extreme possible avenue. The evidence, the testimony, everything came together to show that Brenda was the one responsible for Kendra Hatcher's murder. So, at the end of the trial, jurors only deliberated for 20 minutes before they came back with their verdict. They found Brenda guilty of capital murder, and they sentenced her to life without the possibility of parole. May I ask the presiding juror if the jury has reached a unanimous verdict? <clears throat> Yes, and is your verdict as follows? We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of capital murder as charged in the indictment. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Brenda Delgado, please stand. The jury having found you guilty of capital murder is therefore the order, judgment, and decree of this court that you be taken by the sheriff of Dallas County and by her safely held for transfer to an authorized receiving agency wherein you shall be and transferred to the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, wherein you shall be confined for the rest of your natural life. Good luck to you, ma'am. Brenda Delgado, justice has been served. Even though it's taken three years, nine months, and five days, justice was delivered to my family, Kendra's dear friends, many of who are sitting in this courtroom today and have been with us by our side since the beginning of this hellish nightmare. I take comfort in knowing our God has given our Kendra the ultimate spot in heaven a spot in which you will never see. <clears throat> you, Brenda Delgado, have earned your spot on this earth behind cold steel bars for the rest of your miserable, pathetic life. And if justice could have handed you a death sentence, Make no mistake, I would have been there front and center. To the jurors, I can't imagine the job that you guys have had. This is the second time that we've had to be here for a trial of my sister's murder. And both, both times I've prayed for you, for the jurors. I've thought of the jurors that were on the last trial every single day and prayed for them because the things that you've had to witness see and hear are so inhuman, Brenda Delgado, so inhuman. Nobody should have to see this kind of stuff. I'm so sorry that you did, but I thank you for giving us this little bit of closure. Brenda, you're disgusting. No matter how envious you were of any human being, it does not give you the right to destroy lives many lives, your own family's lives, our lives, Kendra's lives, my children's lives. Who the hell do you think you are, Brenda? You will go down in history as one of the most hated women in Dallas, possibly in America, and soon you'll be forgotten, but Kendra's legacy won't, because we'll make sure that it's not. You can't even look at me. She too has tried to appeal her sentence multiple times, but this has been denied as well. As of right now, Brenda Delgado, Christopher Love, as well as Crystal Cortez are all in prison for the parts that they took in this murder plot. Obviously, after figuring all of this out, Ricky was devastated. 
he truly did not think that Brenda could be capable of anything like this. He did testify at trial, and he was one of the only people that Brenda actually looked at. The entire time, Brenda was not making eye contact with anybody. She wouldn't look at anybody, even Kendra's family, even her own family. But she had made eye contact with Ricky a few times when he was testifying, and he had no sympathy left for her. She took one of the biggest things in his life away that really made him excited about the future. He was excited to live his life with Kendra. And even if it didn't work out because they had only been together a couple of months, that was for him to find out, not for Brenda to decide for him. Since trial, he did still move to California. I'm not sure if he's still there now, but I imagine he wouldn't want to return back to Texas. I certainly wouldn't want to if I was in this situation or a similar one. Of course, Kendra's family, they're all heartbroken. Her ex-husband came out to speak about her as well, and nobody had anything negative to say about her. She truly was an amazing woman who just got herself involved with a man who had an ex that was obsessed with him. Neither her or Ricky could have known that any of this was going on. Who knows if Kendra even knew who Brenda was? This was just such a tragic situation. It's so sad and heartbreaking to know that someone can be murdered for simply being happy in their relationship. That low lowlifes with absolutely nothing better to do than obsess over their ex can just come in and take a life, all because of just this seething jealousy. I just covered the case of Melody Sasser, who attempted to murder a man's wife, and for a reason we honestly don't really even know, it's crazy to see this almost being a bit of a trend where these unstable crazy women are doing the absolute most just to get a woman out of the picture for no other reason than that they're just jealous. It's crazy. I wish that this case ended up similar to Melody's where she couldn't find anybody that was willing to do this for her, that she tried going on hireahitman.com or whatever to hire a hitman for this and that she was caught before it could even take place, but she actually did plan this out as well as she probably could have and I don't know what would have happened in the case if Jose didn't recognize his Jeep on the news. Who knows how long it would have taken for them to solve this case. But thankfully, it is solved. It sucks the way it ended up. It sucks that Brenda decided to take a life just because she was crazed over her ex. It's not that hard to move on, people. I know that it's very, very, very difficult and that you can be heartbroken for months, if not years, after a really tough breakup. It might sound heartless, but it's not, it's not worth it. It's never worth it. Your life, spending the rest of your life in jail, is not worth trying to get back with this other person by trying to take the other person out. Clearly, these people think that they're so smart that they're never going to get caught and that they don't even consider the fact that they're going to spend the rest of their life in jail. But you should consider that if you're thinking about taking someone else out. Any, any situation that involves murder, you should be thinking about the fact that you will probably be caught. Unless you're stupid, like Brenda and the other people in this case. Sorry. But that is all I have for the case, and now I want to know what you all think. What do you think caused Brenda to snap? Do you think there was some sort of mental illness? What do you think of Crystal taking this plea deal? What do you think of Christopher's involvement? Do you think that both him and Brenda should have gotten the same sentence? Or do you think it's appropriate that the actual shooter got death and the planner got a life sentence? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have down below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn those notifications to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you check out my Twitter, Instagram, and my Facebook account. All will be listed down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!